not as dark as you believe. It's not as bad as it may seem. And if it feels like you can't breathe, there's still a voice that's whispering. Your story's not over, cause you're still breathing. What seems like an ending is just a beginning. Hope and the future coming alive. You're gonna make it. You're gonna make it. There's not a word that he can give. His power is perfect.
Come on, if you believe that the promises of God are yes and amen, can you lift a praise tonight? Declare that over your situation right now, whatever need that you came in with tonight. God knows your name, amen. He knows your name. He knows the way that you take. He knows the steps that are ordered. If you would walk in faith tonight and claim the promises of God, he's here. Hallelujah.
it with us. I think we ought to entertain what's happening right now in the Holy Ghost. There's something magnificent going on in this service right now. Go ahead and let your worship flow. Reach out to God. Touch the hem of his garment. Receive the virtue that's flowing right now from the very presence of the Master. Touching your need, your sickness, your crisis your situation wherever you might be God's able to reach you and minister his grace to lift you up and liberate you for he that the son of man is made free is free indeed would you clap your hands to Jesus but give him a shout of praise lift up your voice and give him a shout of praise There's nobody like Jesus. I said, there's nobody like Jesus. It is just great to be home, First Pentecostal Church. I think it's spiritually healthy to go back to the place of your birth and bless all the people of your beginnings. It's just good to go home sometimes. And bless everyone. I thank God for First Pentecostal Church. I give honor to my childhood pastor, Brother J.W. Evans. I give honor to my lifelong pastor, Brother C.D. Thornton. And I give honor to the present pastor and his wife. The man, the myth, the legend. Brother and Sister Ralston are awesome people and you are blessed to have such leadership 
in this church. And really, and I say this sincerely, Aunt Catherine loved you, Brother Ralston. I mean, all she talked about, my favorite preacher. I was her favorite preacher till you came along. Thank you very much. And it's good to see Brother Pete Andrus here. He's got to be 900 years old. Somewhere in that ballpark. But it's great to see him still going. Amen. I just hope some of those genes and Holy Ghost or whatever comes over here and gets a hold of me. It's just great to be home. I love and appreciate every last one of you. And I thank God for you. And I've come to speak something in the Holy Ghost to this church. Brother Paul Grace, pastors in Providence, Louisiana, it's so good to see you here. And I bless you, Brother Grace. Brother John Welch, lift your hand back there. Brother Welch, very dear friend of mine, great evangelist. He's going to be preaching for us in Pensacola in March. We're going to have revival. And what I speak tonight in the Holy Ghost is not only going to come on you, but it's going to rebound back to Pensacola. That what God does here, there's going to be an exponential multiplication of what he does in Pensacola. You cannot sow the seed I'm about to sow and God not give you a harvest of multiplication. I speak abundance on this congregation. I speak multiplication on this congregation. It is the will of God for this church to double. It is the will of God for this church to grow. It is God's purpose. It is God's intention. Now I've been in Pensacola for 21 years. We've had revival and harvest continually. And for some reason or another, I don't know just exactly why, but yet the culture just would not allow us to grow. We could keep up with the attrition rate, but that was about all we could do. We could pray people through to the Holy Ghost and baptize them by the thousands, literally by the thousands. That's not even evangelistically speaking. That's, that's a fact. And we could not grow. And I said, God, what in the world is going on here? And then all of a sudden, the Lord spoke to me something in the spirit. And I began to teach and train our congregation in this. And I want to share with you what I taught them and what I told them. And it literally changed our culture to where the culture allowed for the growth to take place. Not only were we able to overcome the attrition rate, we were able to double that church. Ha. And I speak it on every one of you right now. And I want you to grab a hold of it because God's about to transform your mind and your thinking in the spirit. Now, I'm going to read my text to you in just a moment. But all of these young people are up here are just exciting me. And I just don't even want them hardly to go and sit down. I just want them to stay up here. But I'm, I'm going to let you go ahead and, and be seated. And you can go back and be seated. You've been an awesome audience and you've stood and you've worshipped and you've just been incredible. And I'm going to read my text in a moment. And you can go there, Acts chapter 1, verse 1 through 4. I'm going to read it to you in just a minute. But I talked to them about something that the Lord put on my heart to give them understanding so that they could change and alter their culture in order to receive God's best. I'm not just interested in the goodness of God. I'm interested in receiving what is the best. God has the best for his people prepared. He's just waiting on somebody to say, I'm not going to settle for the good, but I'm going to reach for the best. There's a miracle in the house for somebody. 
Now, you can sit there and hurt if you want to, but I say I'm going for God's best. You can allow the devil to beat your family down if you want to, but I refuse to settle for the good. Just coming to church, beat down. I'm going for the best. I speak life into you. I speak life into you. So here's a concept that I had to get across to him is that you don't come to church to receive anything. Now, that's really odd to say because everyone here needs to receive something from God in order to be saved. You have to receive in order to be saved. But the principle states, and it's plainly stated in the Scripture, that if you do not give, you will not receive. There is a giving that has to precede the receiving. And so you can't come to church to receive alone. You got to come to church and say, I'm going to give everything I've got. <laughs> say, but brother kids, I don't have much energy. If, if the 900 year olds can come to church, don't you tell me you can't walk up in here and start acting like you got something to give. I don't care if you're the most broke down saint of God on the planet. The Bible says you're greater than John the Baptist because the least in the kingdom will be greater than John the Baptist. That's a Jesus statement. That's not Old Testament. That's not Pauline theology. That's Jesus Holy Ghost theology. That means your hand clap is worth something. Your praise is worth something. Don't expect God to do anything till you're willing to give something in this house. Add some value to this service here tonight. So you ought to go ahead and act like you believe it. I think you ought to act like you've already received it, even though you're still in the giving stage. Because he said, if you'll give, I'll make sure that I'll give back, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. That's book. I said, that's book. So I was talking to Brother Tenning, and I'll tell you the other part that I was sharing with our church. I was talking to Brother Tenning just a few weeks before he passed away. And he said, Brian... I'm the last or one of the last men trained by the founding fathers of the Pentecostal movement of the 20th century. He said, I was trained by those that started the Pentecostal church in the early 20th century. And I said, well, Brother Tenney, let me ask you a question. What is the difference between their generation and our generation? Because I want to recover what they had because they had so little and did so much, and we have so much and do so little. And he said, it's one word, Brian. And this is just a few weeks before he left this world, and he said, it's passion. Passion. And he told me about a revival that happened here in Lake Charles. John Williams put up a tent in 1916. They came from all over the Kakashu River Basin, and there were people that got the Holy Ghost out in Gosport. I'm talking about my great-grandmother was in Billy Sunday's revival in Jennings in 1917, and even though Uncle Billy did not preach for Holy Ghost, she got the Holy Ghost speaking with other tongues. My grandmother heard her speaking in tongues and said, as soon as I grow up, I'm going to find me a church that does that strange talking that crazy talking. And she did. She found the church that preached on that Holy Ghost and fire and did that crazy, strange talking. I just want to know, does First Pentecostal Church still talk in tongues? I want to know, is there any crazy talk coming up in here? Go ahead. You might as well get renewed in the Holy Ghost. I'm not going for the good. I'm going for the best. So that's the kind of revival that birthed us. And I want to recover that passion, Lord. I, I got to have passion in my spirit. I want passion to come into this place. 
When that revival was over, now this is Brother Tinney's words. He said only 12 people in Gosport had not received the gift of the Holy Ghost speaking with other tongues. I don't know where he got his information or if it, he was just too far gone and he just pulled it out of the hat. I don't know, but that's what he said. And I said, my God, why don't we just take the whole city? So I had, to, you know, and I've got a great church, but it's an old Pentecostal church. It's been around since, I mean, the 1800s. Uh, not really, but the 1930 is when they started, and it's just way back under. We're reaching almost our 90th year uh, in being a part of the Pentecostal movement. It was born in a fire, and I wanted to recover the passion that that generation had. And so I, I had to teach our church because we're that old church, that classical Pentecostal where everybody comes and waits for the pulpit to perform so they can judge like the American Idol. <laughs> Pong and turn the little seat around. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's the whole, I needed that. No, that's not what we do anymore. You don't come and wait for somebody to sing you into a good mood so you feel like worshiping God. You walk through the door worship. Somebody talk to me right now. I refuse to wait for somebody to clap their hands for me to start worshiping God. I'm going to worship God because I've been worshiping him every day, all week long. So when I get to church, I'm going to bring my passion with me. And share it with everybody. So I taught them to bring their passion with them. You got to bring some passion to the table. You can't expect somebody to perform for you to give you passion. You have to have passion. And so I take you to Acts chapter 1 and verse 1. And this is what it says. Listen carefully. The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs. Passion always precedes proof. You say, but I want God to prove it to me then you're going to have to find some passion before he proves his word and his promise to you. And you got to stay passionate in the waiting period and in the process of the development of the promise. And if you can stay passionate, I'm going to stay passionate in my worship until God doubles our church again. You say, oh, but we've got enough space. We've got enough people now. No, you don't. You need to win the whole city to God. As long as there's one lost soul that needs Jesus, your job is not done. Walk in here and give your passion. I want you to get so passionate about Jesus that nothing can stop your worship. There's not a hurricane. There's not a virus. I don't care if it came from Wuhan or where it came from. The virus can't stop the church. Don't tell me that COVID's going to stop the apostolic church. It was born in a fire in the midst of trouble and trial and adversity. And we shall overcome. So I want you to just bring some passion with you. Now, I, I think you've already got this because when I walked in here, Holy Ghost was all up in this house. And when these kids were up here praising the Lord, and I didn't know whether to sit them down or just let them stay there, they could have stayed right there, and I would have been just fine, preached to them, and I would have had a great time here tonight. There's passion in this place. Do you realize what has happened to First Pentecostal Church? There's an anointing in this house. Now, I know worship, and I know Pentecostal worship, and I know the, the professional Pentecostal worship, but there was something deeper about your worship here tonight that was more than professional Pentecostalism. 
There was a passion in your worship. And I'll tell you what, Jesus was being exalted. Jesus was being magnified. But here's the key about passion. Here's the key that I wanted them to get 10 years ago. They caught this vision. Is that passion comes from relationship, not circumstance. Because the Bible says in Exodus chapter 1, the more they were afflicted about Israel being afflicted, the more they grew. Meaning that the only place they could find comfort was in the arms of one another. And passion was developed and relationship was developed. Therefore, babies were born and they began to multiply. Affliction will not make you grow. And I'm speaking growth on this church. Don't tell me it's not the will of God for you to grow. Yet yeah, means we might have to build a bigger building. So what? God can pay for anything. Listen to me. The Holy Ghost has sent me to declare to you this church is going to grow. It is God's purpose for you to grow. And the more you were afflicted and the more hurricanes and floods the devil tries to put on you, the more you're going to grow. Because affliction caused them to get connected and the only comfort they could find, they couldn't find it from the pharaohs, they couldn't find it from the slave drivers, they couldn't find it in the whips, they couldn't find it in the work, they had to find it in each other. And that's what we've got to realize is that we still need each other. Listen, I cannot do church the way God wants us to do church by myself. I need everyone in this house giving me whatever you've got. I don't care how tired you are. I don't care how messed up your life is. I don't care how much of a sinner you are. You can give something to this service to say, I'm going to invest something in this place and I'm going to receive what God has for me. I promise you, after we baptize you in Jesus' name, your sins will be washed away. When you get the Holy Ghost, you'll have power to tell the devil, I do not want you in my life and God will hear you. Passion always precedes proof. And God never gives the proof until we decide to be passionate about the things that pertain to the kingdom of God. You know as well as I do that every promise has a waiting period. But I'm not going to wait until church is over to discover my passion. I'm not going to get to church and try to find it and so somebody has to perform for me. Brother Ralston don't need to shake my hand. You don't even need to like this message. I'm preaching a good message whether you like it or not. I don't care because passion percolates in an attitude of commitment. I'm committed to speak this word. And I know when I come up here, the devil's going to resist it. But I also know that I've got an anointing on me that can break that yoke. And we're fixing to break the yoke off of somebody's neck right now that's trying to hold back on God. And you need to just give it up for Jesus and say, Lord, let this church grow. You say, but it's liable to get filled up with sinners. That's exactly what I want to happen in Pensacola. I want the lost to get all up in the house. I want you to walk in and think it's a Baptist church. But by the time I get them full of the Holy Ghost and baptized in Jesus' name, I'll turn them into Holy Ghost, Holiness, Apostolic. God's about to give this church favor with other denominations to open their pulpits and allow your pastor to preach Holy Ghost and revival into their lives. God's not just going to pour out his spirit in this church. He's going to pour out his spirit in the Baptist church. He's going to pour out the Holy Ghost in the Catholic church. 
He's going to pour out the Holy Ghost all in every denomination represented in this city. And your passion is about to ignite the dream. Somebody needs to encourage it. Somebody needs to give something to this service to encourage it. Now, here's how you develop passion. And you've got to know some things in order to develop passion. You've got to know some things about God and about his word. First of all, you've got to know the message that you're going to declare. If you don't know your message and what you believe, it's very difficult for you to be passionate. You've got to know your message. You've got to know what you believe. You've got to be able to speak what you believe and to cast that vision into people's lives. And even though you may not be a guru, you may not have all the knowledge of the word, you can still encourage somebody and let them know God's going to help you. But I'm in trouble, Brother Kinsey. I need help. Well, why don't you help somebody that might be worse off than you? The Holy Ghost you have is greater than your trouble. It's greater than your pain. It's greater than your agony. I got all things going wrong in my life and around me, but I'm not going to let it stop me from being passionate, and I'm not going to allow it to stop me from speaking this word because God has sent me to declare it, and I'm going to rejoice when I hear the report of what God's doing through this church and this pastor. But in order for you to develop passion, you got to find your voice. You got to learn how to speak up. You got to speak of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. You got to speak your faith. You got to speak your praise. You can't just simply know it. You got to say it. You got to say it until God gives it to you. You got to say it until you see it. It's what Brother Billy Cole all, always taught us. He said, Brian, you got to say it until you see it. Keep saying it until you see it. And so I just speak that into your life. Say it, church. Say it, we're going to double. Say it, we're going to have vision. Say it, I'm passionate about the kingdom of God. Quit telling me you're tired. Everybody's tired. I'm just tired of being tired. I'm tired of you talking about being tired. Everybody in this church is tired. Some of you look tired. I'm sick and tired of people looking tired. I'm sick and tired of looking in the mirror and seeing tired. So I'm going to speak. I've got life. I've got passion. I've got joy. Somebody tell me right now. Somebody tell me that God is good. I know you have to give up your bitterness. I know you got to give up your hurt. I know you got to give up your unforgiving spirit. You got to give up that yoke that has bound you. But I wish somebody in this house would start speaking it. I know my message. And I know my master. I know him by name. He's the one. He's the one that has delivered me. He's the one that has made me free. I know who he is. And his name is Jesus. Does anybody know the master? If you don't know the master, then you're not going to be able to forgive anybody. You can't give up your wounds. You can't give up your bitterness. Because sometimes we wrap our wounds around us as an excuse to get disinvolved and disconnect. Somebody hurt me. Somebody said something to me. Well, people have said something to me all my life. I'm not going to let that stop me. And if you think I'm going to sit in that back row and then sulk because somebody said something to me, you got another thing coming. I'm going to rise above that realizing I've got a passion for the master. Now, I might have to press my way through the crowd, but I'm going to touch that hem of his garment, and that virtue's going to flow because I know who he is. He's available for everyone in this house. Passion. You got to know your mission. You got to know why you're here. Say, well, I came to sing or I came to play. Well, if you did that, then that's really not enough because you need to know why you're here. I know my mission. I know my message and I know my master and my mission. I know why I am here. 
I came to speak this word. The enemy wants to stop it. He wants to do everything because some of you realize in your life, there's just no way I can take another step forward. I can't even go forward. It seems like every which way I turn is the wrong way and I'm pinned down and I'm pinned in and I'm in a jailhouse and it seems like I'm in prison, but I can unlock that door and open it in Jesus' name. And speak to it right now and say, in the name of Jesus, prison door open. Habits be gone. Addictions, I come against you in Jesus' name. Despondency, despair, and discouragement, I come against you right now. Church, you're in the greatest hour the church has ever been in existence. And it's time now for somebody to rise up and say, I know my message, I know my mission, and I know my master. I know why I'm here. I know why I'm worshiping. I want to exalt Jesus because I want everybody in the house to be free. I want you to be liberated. I want you to know how powerful he is. I want you to know how great he is. Because when you get this kind of passion in your spirit, there's no devil that can stop you. There's no discouragement that can hinder you. There is no evil that can stop you from doing what God wants you to do. There's power in the name of Jesus. Uh, if you'll just begin to speak it. Come on, you got to communicate with the teacher. you got to say it. I believe that. I say yes. I say amen. I declare it. There's something happening in this place. I know why I'm here. Every one of you are powerful in Jesus Christ. But there's a choice you have to make in everything you do. So keep in mind that in the end, the choice you make makes you. The reason why people lose passion, they come to church, they receive something, but they lose passion is because their choices do not match what they say they believe. They say they believe this, but they make these choices to do this. And your choices will always overturn anything else that happens in your life. That's everybody. You've got to make the right choices. So here's three choices I have made in my life. And I've just decided, made up my mind, this is the way it's going to be no matter what happens. And I've lived this all of my life. I've literally lived this. This isn't just something I found in a book. This is something I've lived First of all, I choose to be happy. Yeah, I figured it would go over like that. Like a ham sandwich at a Jewish wedding. Yeah, I get it. Let's try it again. I choose. Go ahead. And choose to be happy and see if you can't aggravate everybody around you. Go on and just choose it. Choose to smile in spite of the pain and see if you don't aggravate everybody in your life. How many of you are morning people and you get up early and you just wake up and you're ready to go and you're excited about the day? How many of you bounce out of bed like Tigger? How many of you are not morning people? You got to have your coffee before you don't mess with me in the morning. How many of you are not even an evening person? You're not even a people. Any time we meet you all day long, you're still messed up. If we meet you in the afternoon, you're mad. And we get you up in the morning, you're mad. You're just mad. I don't know what you're mad about, but you've got the Holy Ghost and fire. You got the best pastor. This is the best church. You can't find a better church than First Pentecostal. What you talking about? You got a Jesus that died on the cross, rose again on the third day, and he can heal any sickness. He can deliver you from any disease. He can rescue you from any crisis. He can bring you out of the flood, lift you above the hurricane, and give you a whole new sanctuary where you can put, fill it up with souls that need Jesus. You ought to choose to be happy. Well, maybe you're evening people, all right? So if you're an evening person, praise God, I at least have three happy people in the house. It ain't morning time, but I'm still happy, even though I love the morning.
Now, my wife hates the morning. She thinks people that bounce out of bed like Tigger are the devil. <laughs> she really does. So you've got to, you know, I'm waking up and I'm saying, whoa, this is the day that the Lord has made. Well, I've been married for 45 years to the same woman because I learned when I get out of bed now. <laughs> and then I go on and do my devotion. But I'm going to choose to be happy no matter what I'm going through. I don't care what the devil tries to throw at me. I've made a choice, and my choice creates passion. I know what I believe. I've got a message. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And with joy, you shall draw water out of the wells of salvation. Come on, somebody get some joy. Get your bucket of joy and start drawing. Hallelujah. I make a second choice. I choose to be a self-motivator. Mm. Yeah, that was even worse than the happy. <laughs> Self-motivator. No, I got to, somebody's got to sing to me first. Somebody's got to do something for me. What in the world do you need done for you other than Jesus dying on a cross for you? Now, you, you answer me that. Riddle me this. You need what? Jesus died on a cross to save you. You don't need nothing else. But get up out my way. I'm coming to the master because he's got the answer. There's not a program we can put in the house that will meet everybody's need. But if Jesus walks in, there isn't a need he can't meet. My motivation comes from the cross. Why did he call the cross? Obviously in Acts chapter 1, the, the word passion is connected to the cross. He was referring to the cross. Is he talking about the pain? Is he talking about the suffering or the price that he paid for our sin in, in reference to the pain? No, he's talking about relationship. Why did Paul say, I will glory in nothing but the cross? Why did he say that I will glory in nothing but the cross? Because he understood something you need to understand. That there is absolutely no way we can have a relationship with a holy God as a sinful man without the power of the cross. There isn't enough praise or righteousness you can produce that can give you a justified standing before God. But one drop of the blood that fell from that cross can eliminate. You hear me now. That's why he called the cross a passion. Is because it is a possibility of relationship between sinful man and a holy God. I just haven't gotten over the cross. There's power in the cross. I've got a connection, not because the committee said I was holy. I'm not righteous because somebody judges me righteous. I am righteous because I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. I'm not worshiping so you'll think I'm spiritual. I'm worshiping because Jesus is alive. Now, you might think he's dead, but Jesus is not dead. He is not in that tomb in Jerusalem. He's not in that tomb in the garden. He is risen. So that ought to motivate you. If you're a sinner, listen to me. You don't even have to qualify. Sister Thornton, I did not see you here. Bless your heart. I looked for you, but I couldn't see you because these glasses, I got new glasses and the glare blinds me. I can't see half of y'all out there. I can see the front row and right up here. But Sister Thornton, I love you. That's a faithful lady. And I wondered, she's been nodding her head, praising God, and I was wondering, who is that? And then finally, the light I, now I've got you. Sister Thornton, I love you. Listen, if she can worship God. Let me say it one more time. If she can worship God, she can't run like I can run. 
She can't worship like I can worship, but she's still worshiping God just as good as I am. She's been through it, but she's come through it. Woo! Come on, church. I know you've been through stuff, but you've come through it. And I want you to begin to rejoice and know that Jesus has made it possible. And I hope y'all don't mind, but I've got to shout a little bit. Glory to God. I feel something happening in this place. If you could get up, become a self-motivator. Quit waiting on somebody to do something. Quit waiting on him to start worshiping and just start it yourself. Now, let me explain this to you because this is what the Holy Ghost showed me in Pensacola. And you just need to understand this because God's fixing to use me to break this off of you. Now, I don't know if you could have sensed it, but during COVID and these hurricanes and everything that happened, floods and, and all of that and all the craziness that went on through all of this, I don't know if you sensed that spirit of depression now, I'm, I'm, I say this not because I'm rebuking you for it, okay? This is not a correction. This is a fact. I'm not a depressed person, and I have fought that spirit. It came on me, and I said, no way. You are not going to mess with me because I'm, I know better. I know better, and I still couldn't help it. It was on me, and I said, what is the deal? I rebuked this, and I rebuked it, and it still didn't work, move because it wasn't just something on me. It was something behind that virus. It's a one-world government, and I called it the spirit of Antichrist. The spirit of the Antichrist was behind that virus. And that's why you feel that pressure on you right now. It's not because you have failed God or you don't have faith. You've got faith and you wouldn't be here tonight. You've got faith. You love Jesus, but it's real. And it'll cause anxiety and fear and panic attacks. And I, I was waking up with panic attacks and all kinds of things. I said, God, this is not me. What are you doing? He says, I want you to feel what your people are going through. So you'll be more sympathetic and compassionate towards them so you can help them overcome it. Well, I said, thank you very much. And I said, well, now I know why I'm going through it. So I could accept it and understand, and now I know how to fight it. I'm not fighting for myself. That was the mistake I made. I was trying to fight it for myself. And when you fight it for yourself, you get entangled with it more and you become trapped by it more. So I decided I was going to fight it for everybody else and not myself. Whoa. I started laying hands on people. I was as depressed as you can get. And I'm laying hands on I said, everybody that's depressed, everybody in the church came up. I'm going to pray for all of you. And I said, I'm depressed, but I'm going to pray that you're going to get. As soon as I started praying for them, it lifted off of me. It lifted off of me. And then all of a sudden, the Holy Ghost fell in that place. And God delivered them from that spirit. That spirit of pain. That spirit of panic. That spirit of anxiety. I mean, it'll just come on you out of nowhere. You'll go to bed feeling good, wake up, and all of a sudden something crazy going on in your brain. And I could not figure it out until I realized this isn't about me. This is about God wanting to use me to deliver others. That is why I'm here, is to deliver you. Because once you get this deliverance, you're going to start growing there's going to be such growth. There's going to be such multiplication. It's going to blow your mind. You listen to me. The backsliders coming back to this church. I started speaking that to our church. And I'm talking about people that shook their fist in the air and said, I'll never step foot in another Pentecostal church for the rest of my life. I've, I've, I've watched them 
walk through that back door and run to that altar and get the Holy Ghost over again. And now sitting on that pew, adding value to the church and worshiping God and filled with joy because God can do anything. And they're coming back. So if you've been bothered by that spirit, I want you to lift your hand. If it's happened in your life exactly as I have described it, if it has affected you, if it has come on you, we're going to rebuke it right now in Jesus' name. And God is going to deliver you completely. And you're going to walk out of here free. And the Lord is going to make you free in this place right now. The Holy Ghost is on you. The power of God. I'm just doing exactly what God sent me here to do. Because this church is growing. I can feel it in the spirit that God's going to grow this church powerfully. And God's going to liberate you right now. I feel it lifting. Go ahead and believe it. Go on and let that other tongue flow out of your mouth as the Spirit gives you a... I feel the Holy Ghost on you right now. Go ahead. Let that Holy Ghost come on you. Hallelujah, Rabbi. Go ahead and believe God for it. Now... I don't know how comfortable y'all are, but it seemed like you're pretty comfortable coming up here. Y'all was all up here jumping up and down, praising him. But if you want deliverance, I want you to step forward right now. You want God to liberate you and free you so that you can walk out of here liberated and free. I want you to step forward. The Holy Ghost is about to do this work in your life right now. It's not a condemnation. It's not a rebuke. It's not a correction. It's just a fact of the spirit of the Antichrist that worketh in the earth. That has affected us and has kept us from making the choice to be joyful. Making the choice to be self-motivated. Making the choice to be respectful and to honor and to love and to bless. When I learned how to bless others, God released something in my spirit that transformed me. And it will transform you if you can bless rather than curse. That's a choice you make. And when you make the choice, I will bless and I will not curse. I will not let curses come out of my mouth. And I'm not talking about using expletives. I'm talking about talking, using what the Hebrews call Lashon Hara, which is evil speaking of others. I will not speak evil of others. I will bless. I will not do the Lashon Hara. I will speak blessing upon God's people and release his blessing upon you. And it's going to happen right now. And the depression's going to lift. God's going to show you that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Don't be afraid of the spirit of the Antichrist because he's still an agent of the Lord and God is more powerful than the Antichrist. I mean, he's real. The, the spirit of it is real and it's affecting us, but it's not, it's not stronger than my God. Greater is he that is shata bohor. There's an anointing on you right now. Receive it in the name of Jesus. Go ahead and let that Holy Ghost flow through you. Hey, Brother John Welch, where are you? Paul, Grace, where are you? Where are you? John, I need you up here. Brother Grace, come up here. I want, Brother Grace, I want you to take this side, and I want you to lay hands on everyone you can lay hands on. Brother Welch, I want you to take this side. I'm going to take the middle. Brother Ralston can just move because he knows the congregation. He knows who's here, and I don't. So he can just move around as he feels led and he knows what's going on. So I'm just going to take the middle. Brother Welch, you go over there and take the right and just start going all the way to the right. Brother Paul Grace, start there and go all the way to the left and lay hands on everything you can. 
Now you're going to have to receive. As soon as our hands are laid on you, receive it. Jesus loves you. That's my master. I know him. He died on the cross for you. And if he did that, there's possibility for relationship. There's possibility for transformation. There's possibility for you to become whatever he wants you to be because of what he did at the cross. And I claim that for you right now. And there's no depression that can stop you. There's no feelings that can stop you in Jesus' name. Father, I ask that the Holy Ghost would come upon her and give her victory right now in Jesus' name. Give us victory in this house.